Hello. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to over 150 people from across the U.S. and Israel who are joining us today. My name is Jen Raskis, and I am the director of the Israel Action Center at the JCRC, Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington. The JCRC is proud to represent more than 100 organizations and synagogues throughout the region as the public affairs and community relations arm of the Greater Washington Jewish Community. Through our events and briefings, including today's conference call, we empower, train, and mobilize our community to engage with and advocate for Israel. Please visit our website, www.jcouncil.org, to get involved and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Today, we are honored to welcome Ambassador Dennis Ross, Middle East expert at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, for a wide-ranging discussion and analysis of the President's decertification of the Iran deal. We look forward to hearing Ambassador Ross discuss congressional options, next steps, possible outcomes, and implications for the U.S., Israel, and the global community. Ambassador Dennis Ross is a counselor and the William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Prior to returning to the Institute in 2011, he served as Special Assistant to President Obama as the National Security Council and the National Security Council Senior Director for the Central Region. He was also a Special Advisor for the Persian Gulf and Southwest Asia, which includes Iran, to then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. For more than 12 years, Ambassador Ross played a leading role in shaping U.S. involvement in the Middle East peace process and dealing directly with the parties in negotiations, serving as a point person for the peace process for both President George H.W. Bush and President Clinton. Ambassador Ross will speak for approximately 20 minutes. Then we will open the floor for Q&A. At that time, Alexis Schwartz, the JCRC's Associate Director of the Israel Action Center, and I will moderate the Q&A. If you have a question, please dial star six on your phone to be added to the queue. Please remember that questions should be kept short and to the point so that we have time for as many as possible and a friendly reminder that questions end with a question mark. Please note that this call is on the record and being recorded. And now it is my pleasure to turn over to Ambassador Dennis Ross for his remarks. Um, thank you. I'm, I have to start off by acknowledging I was on my way to Israel today, flying from Washington, D.C. To, to Newark and then from Newark on to, to Israel, and the flight was canceled. So I'm in the middle of, of now switching flights about to board a flight to Chicago. So I may, as we go through this, actually have to board the flight, but let me at least start and um, and sort of give you the kind of rudimentaries of what's going on. First, the Inara represented legislation that the Congress adopted at the time the, of the, the JCPOA had been concluded, but it was clear that there was not going to be a sufficient vote to override a presidential veto. When it became clear that there would not be such a vote, uh, and it was clear that there would not be um, an ability to, to somehow have con the Congress uh, either vote for or, in a sense, veto the JCPOA, with the recognition that the JCPOA, which was what that stands for, is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, when it was clear that this was going to be able to survive and go through the um, uh, go through the Congress, was adopted at that point was a um, say legislation whose purpose was to hold the, the administration's feet to the fire. By that I mean they didn't trust the, uh, there was no trust for uh, how the Obama administration, fairly or not, was going to uh, hold the Iranians uh, to the terms. So the Congress wanted every 90 days for there to be a certification that there was no material breach of the agreement by uh, the Iranians. There was, if there had been a material breach, it had been corrected, uh, that the administration could certify that Iran was taking no steps that could advance its nuclear weapons program uh, and that the sanctions relief was proportional to the benefits that were coming from the deal. The first two, uh, with the 90-day certification, first two times for six months of the, uh, of the Trump administration, the administration certified. The president made it clear up second time he didn't want to. He he basically, over the opposition of the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, 
um, made it clear he wouldn't certify again. So they came up with a compromise. The compromise was there wouldn't be a certification, but uh, we would not walk away from the deal. When the president gave his speech, he made it clear he was not walking away from the deal now. But as he didn't walk away from the deal now, if we weren't satisfied on the areas of our concern, which include ballistic missile testing, which should be a concern because the ballistic missiles really carry, the, the ballistic missiles are in fact the, a delivery vehicle for nuclear weapons. Uh, and you'll have to excuse me because I'm at the airport, as I said, about to have to board the plane. Um, but the, uh, the ballistic missile testing was one issue. The sun sign provisions, key limitations in terms of the amount of low enriched uranium that can be had on hand, the level at which uranium can be enriched uh, is something that expires. The limitations on that expire after year 15. And so that's what's known as a sunshine provision, meaning that these limitations, by the way, not the monitoring limitations, but these limitations on the enrichment, the amount, the level, the quality, uh, expires after 15 years. Similarly, uh, nuclear, nuclear reprocessing capabilities, which would be used for plutonium separation of plutonium bomb, there, it being understood, there are two kinds of, of pathways to building a nuclear bomb. One is through enriched uranium. The other is through uh, plutonium separation. After 15 years, nothing is the Iranians are not prohibited from building a reprocessing plant, which would allow them to pursue a, a plutonium route. After 15 years, they're not prevented from creating highly enriched uranium, which is basically bomb level, a uh, bomb uh, level of enrichment. So the point is, the sunshine provisions, the ballistic missile testing, and Iran's destabilizing behavior in the region are all things that the president wants to affect and the, the theory of the administration and certainly the uh, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, even though they don't want to walk away from the deal, because they know if we do, we'll be the only ones who walk away from the deal. They want to use the European desire to keep us in the deal as a lever to try to get them to address some of these provisions. And I would say the the more the tone of the administration takes account of European concerns, the greater the likelihood that they might be willing to negotiate at least supplemental arrangements. Already the President of France has said we will not negotiate the deal. All the members of the 5 plus 1 other than the U.S. have said they will not negotiate or renegotiate the deal. But what they have said is that they will, uh, they are willing to go ahead uh, and discuss supplemental arrangements for what should come after the period when, uh, when the limitations within the deal expire. Um, are they prepared to address the, the regional issues. Uh, I think they are prepared to address the regional issues, but not connected to the JCPOA. They don't want the JCPOA to be brought into question because they fear if it is, then you'll, then you'll have a nuclear crisis with Iran, even as you have a nuclear crisis with, um, with the North Koreans. So the, the essence of what has happened is the administration is not certified. They're trying to use the, the readiness not to walk away from the deal right now, as a lever to get the Europeans at least to be prepared to negotiate supplemental arrangements at least on ballistic missiles, uh, and also uh, on the sunshine provisions, uh, and also to have discussions on Iran's destabilizing behaviors in the region. At this point, I think the Europeans remain concerned that the administration is looking for an excuse to walk away from the deal. So long as they look at it that way, they'll be very reluctant to actually negotiate. If they become convinced that the U.S. won't walk away, but will negotiate in good faith. And I've actually made a suggestion we appoint a senior envoy from the outside as a way of demonstrating the seriousness in which we are prepared to approach dealing with the concerns the Europeans have, even as uh, our own concerns about the sunshine provisions uh, and the ballistic missiles, et cetera, are being addressed. Uh, this would at least prove to the Europeans that this is a good faith effort that responds to concerns that we both have. So... Um, I'm going to pause there uh, as I board my flight. I can hear you as any questions are posed to me, and I'll try to address them. Great. We just switched to Q&A. Please, again, press star six if you have a question. Um, while the questions are coming up, we would just like to ask you, are you able, Ambassador Ross, to elaborate on how Israel's leaders and the general public in Israel is viewing this? certification and the possible outcome? Yes, I am. Um, 
clearly the prime minister's position has been summarized in what you would call a slogan of fix it or nix it. Uh, he's been against the agreement. He believes that the, that the agreement all along creates a legitimate basis for Iran to have nuclear weapons later on. It certainly legitimizes a very, it certainly legitimizes a very large nuclear infrastructure. Uh, and so he says this needs to be corrected. So he's adopted the position of, as he puts it, fix it. And he's applauding what the, uh, what the administration has done to this point. Now, others in the security establishment have been, thank you, have been um, a little bit more concerned about making sure if the U.S. walks away, they know what's going to happen. Um, Interview. There are those who say, "Look, if we just propose that, sorry, Ambassador Russ, I think your reception is going in and out a little bit." So, so I think the well, the Prime Minister certainly is consistent in his position of wanting to see this fixed. There are others who are, I think, share the idea that the vulnerabilities or flaws in the deal need to be addressed in some fashion, but they also don't want to see the deal collapse because they think that Iran will be the one that presents itself as a victim uh, and there won't be sanctions imposed on it. So I would say um, in general, there is a kind of consensus in Israel that there needs to be a way to address the vulnerability of the deal, but it needs to be done in a way that actually does not produce Iran being able to present itself as a victim and uh, and somehow puts itself in a position where it continue can, to proceed with its program, not be under sanctions, uh, because in the end what the U.S. has done doesn't gain the support of others. Uh, I do believe it's possible to gain the support of others, provided that, as I said, we, we can demonstrate that we're quite serious about um, trying to... Um, trying to uh, negotiate thank you so much we're going to go to our first caller yes uh, good afternoon thank you ambassador ross this is uh, ben cohen from the alga minor newspaper speaking could you say a little bit more about this senior envoy post that you have in mind well, I don't, I mean, look, the, the idea of the, the senior envoy is um, having someone from outside the administration who has, uh, who would be seen as a credible person who wouldn't be coming in to engage in this unless they were prepared to approach it in a serious way, meaning we don't walk away from our concerns, but we're prepared to take account of the European concerns. The logic here is if we don't have the Europeans, we really don't have anything. If we are alone, uh, our ability to maintain the leverage on the Iranians begins to disappear. The logic of, of making it clear that we're going to fix, or the logic that we need to be in a position where we can um, have our concerns addressed and that the Europeans don't want us to walk away does give us the potential for leverage, provided the Europeans become convinced that this is something that is a... a a genuine effort on our part. So, you know, I would like to see someone who's a senior person who gets appointed. I'll give you an example. I don't know how many people know this, but the, the administration appointed um, a guy named Kurt Volker, uh, who's a very serious guy, very well-respected. He was appointed to help with the Afghanistan strategy. He was appointed as an Afghanistan envoy. Um, Take someone like Kirk, Kirk, you know, if there was a comparable person, maybe someone, you know, like an Elliot Abrams, who um, would be seen as credible by, um, by the Europeans, who would present our concerns about the deal, which are real and they're genuine. I've outlined some of them. I obviously share them myself. Um, you know, at the time of the JCPOA, I identified five conditions which didn't require renegotiation of the deal, but five conditions that for me needed to be addressed 
if in fact there was going to be, if, if I was to support the deal. And when they weren't, I didn't. I didn't oppose it, but I didn't support it. So bringing in someone who is mindful of the flaws within the deal, but also understands that we need to create a consensus uh, between ourselves and the Europeans, uh, that's what I have in mind. So it's uh, an Elliot Abrams time, someone who would be the equivalent of that, someone who has done diplomacy, someone who's done negotiation, someone who the Europeans are already familiar with and will take seriously. That's really what I have in mind. Great. Thank you so much. We're going to our next caller. Hello, Ambassador Ross. Uh, thank you very much. This is Barry Schmuckler in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, so what is the basis for uh, assuming the validity of the certification and the JCPOA itself for detecting nuclear products when, number one, military sites can never be inspected, the so-called 24-7 access really is 21 days where the sites are totally in Iran's control uh, uh, and, uh, and sites that were not identified at the type, time of signing or subsequently developed um, are never going to be inspected. And finally, uh, my understanding is, in fact, there are not even U.S. inspectors allowed on the inspection team. Thank you. All right, so let me, let me clarify something. It's a long one, I know. <laughs> yeah, but so let me clarify some of what you said. Um, I mean, one of the things about the JCPOA is that the people who were for it dramatically overclaimed what it was. The people who were against it said it was the worst thing since Munich, and the truth is they were both wrong. It, it provided real limitations for 15 years. It provides significant verification access uh, for 25 years. Uh, and to give you an idea of, of just the, the issue that you were raising about access, the Iranians were saying publicly there would be no access to military sites. But there is, according to the deal, uh, a requirement whenever the United States or any, any of the other members of the 5 plus 1 have a reason to be suspicious about a site, access to that site is supposed to be given. What you're right is that uh, there's a joint commission as part of the JCPOA uh, in which the, um, the joint commission of which the five plus one sit on with the Iranians. If a single member of that joint commission has a concern about a site, including a military site, it, it has to explain why it has suspicions about that site. The Iranians have 14 days in which to respond. If they don't respond in 14 days, there is an additional seven-day clock which kicks in, uh, and by the end of the 21st day, they have to allow access to that site. You know, the truth is it ends up being another three days. It ultimately ends up being 24 days. Now, that sounds terrible. Um, and obviously, if you're talking about computer size things, if it's more than two hours, it's, you know, they can move things out. If it involves radioactive material, you can't wipe it away. You can't clean it. It doesn't disappear within. It has a long uh, shelf life. Uh, it doesn't disappear within uh, within 24 days. Um, to put this in perspective, as part of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, here again, it's not just declared sites that you have access to. And the one thing where we have, where the JCPOA gives 24-7 monitoring is of all the declared sites. What we're really talking about here are non-declared sites or suspect sites. And there you're dealing with the issue, as I said, of up to 24 days. If access isn't provided after 24 days, then the sanctions will automatically snap back in, which is obviously something that the Iranians don't want. So the, the significance of this is, while it's a limitation, it is actually better than anything that exists within the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty now. While you're supposed to have access to non-declared and suspect sites, unlike what it was built in the JCPA, there is no time limit. Uh, in the NPT, there is a time limit as part of the JCPOA. As for the issue of American inspectors, the IAEA has technicians. The technicians are specialists. They don't, when they write a report on what they see, they don't write interpretations. They write what they see, what they consider this to be. They don't write it with a political content. These are 
these are technicians and what they what they describe is what they you know is what they see um, the Iranians have said they don't want to have American inspectors as part of that team they say the you know the Americans will be spies so the um, uh, so um, uh, the question really is I think a is the uh, is the administration has the administration gone to the Joint Commission and presented to the Joint Commission uh, information on suspect sites I think the answer at this point is no uh, but it could and B um, have the range actually excluded American technicians from inspections uh, and there I'm not aware that the IAEA has, has excluded has chosen to exclude people although it may be there have not been American technicians uh, on the monitoring uh, at this point uh, the short answer is I just I just don't know whether they have chosen as a, to bring non-Americans as a way of avoiding a potential problem with the Iranians but I think that answers your question great we're going to our next caller Oh, okay. It looks like actually um, all the callers that were in our queue have been able to ask a question. So I'm just going to ask um, another question. Um, if there are callers on the line who have additional questions, you're welcome to join the queue for as long as Ambassador Ross is not yet in the sky. Uh, <laughs> Ambassador Ross. <laughs> yeah, I, I thank you for indulging me. This is I was supposed to be at Newark, but that didn't work out yeah no I, I think probably everyone on this call has had a uh, flight cancellations before so we can all we can all relate um, so we, we had one question thinking about global ramifications um, I know you mentioned North Korea earlier um, Trump also mentioned North Korea in his announcement by saying that we've seen in North Korea the longer we ignore a threat the worse the threat becomes and others are pointing to the decertification and saying that it undercuts the US's credibility to make a diplomatic resolution with North Korea can you address sort of how this whole situation uh, could possibly affect the situation between the US and North Korea right now sure it's a really good question um, one of the things there I'll tell you an argument that is made the argument that is made is that the you know, why would North Korea negotiate an agreement with us if um, if we've just walked away from an international agreement that was worked out with the five permanent members of Security Council plus Germany uh, if we're going to do that and walk away why would everybody take us uh, seriously that's the argument that's made um, well I think there's something to it I actually I view it as a debating point rather than a really serious point if North Korea arrived at the point where it was ready to to actually seriously negotiate on its program with us it would find a way to do so and one of the things that, that the Kim Jong-un wants is you know, a he wants to re he wants to retain his nuclear weapons on the one hand, and ultimately he wants there to be an exclusively bilateral negotiation with the United States as a way of separating the United States from South Korea, and as a way of ultimately creating a, a direct peace treaty between the United States and North Korea. Uh, the argument that if he thought it was suddenly in his interest to do that, that he wouldn't do it because the U.S. walked away from the JCPOA, it's like a because I think you know, the reason there isn't a negotiation right now is a two-way the administration doesn't want to talk to them because they think it's as the President Trump said the uh, Secretary of State was wasting his time Kim Jong-un doesn't want to talk until after he has ICBMs that are nuclear on tip because he thinks it creates greater leverage for him in each case those assessments on each side are not connected to the Iran deal so I think the circumstances that are part of North Korea and what's feeding this is need will be should be viewed separately does it raise questions in the minds of others internationally when we walk away from an agreement no question it does for sure I mean to think that you can walk away from you just like the Obama administration when it walked away not from what was a negotiated agreement but it walked away from the Bush your own letter the presidential commitment um, to the Prime Minister of Israel presidential commitments are, are always respected by their successors because if they're not then what you end up with is uh, the commitments are good for only one one term now that's not the equivalent of walking away from an internationally negotiated agreement in terms of the impact on others but in terms of the perception of how good our word is when we don't live up to the commitments that we make it has an, it certainly has an effect internationally 
I create that as a separate reality from what I see between the United States and North Korea. I mean, I'm happy to talk about what I think we should be doing with North Korea, um, but I, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's an argument, but I'm not convinced by it that, um, that the issue of the JCPOA per se is what the Kim Jong Un is looking at and will affect uh, his calculus. I don't see that. I, and I just, I'll just wrap this up by saying I do think if you, if you walk away from an agreement like this, there are ramifications, there are implications, and you need to think through them, and you also need to think what takes its place. You know, one thing I like to say that nature abhors a vacuum. Well, in the Middle East, vacuums are always filled by the worst possible forces. We've seen that on the ground, but if, if we, if in the end we walk away from the JCPOA and nothing has changed, well, there will be a vacuum that will be filled on this issue, and it, I'm not so sure it's going to be such a good one. Thank you so much. We, uh, we do have another caller, so here's another question. Hi, uh, this is Jerry Brown in Rockville, uh, Maryland. Uh, Ambassador Ross, thank you very much for joining us. Um, from what we can tell, what's the reaction of the Iranians to this, um, you know, both in the, uh, you know, sort of the IRGC, the mullahs, um, you know, President Rouhani, who obviously has a lot invested in this deal, uh, the, the Iranian public, what are, uh, you know, what's their take on all this, and, and how do you think it plays out? Um, I do think the, the rhetoric of the administration uh, is being used to create a kind of coalescence within the regime itself. I don't think the Iranian public is necessarily a big fan of the regime, although one thing you see is every time the Iranian public has a chance to vote, they always vote for those who they think are going to produce greater normalization with the outside world and greater normalization with the region and some greater liberalization within the country. Usually those hopes and expectations get frustrated because the regime is not about doing all of those things. It wants to retain its control. So I think that the public is less influenced by this. I do think that it has probably created some greater coalescence within the within the elite itself which is characterized by a lot of infighting um, I think also what the Iranians are mostly trying to do is present themselves to the other members of the five plus one as a victim that they're not one they're not the ones threatening the, the JCPOA it's the Americans who are threatening the JCPOA, the JCPOA. But one thing I think to keep in mind this is an important point when the JCPOA was concluded one of its elements was that the sanctions regime could not be terminated for eight years it was only suspended and that's six more years from now Iran in my mind won't walk away from this deal because they don't want to be the ones to trigger a, a snapback of all the sanctions they want to present themselves as the victim they want to present the US as the one that's creating the problems they want to use that as a justification to have even have the Europeans do even more business with Iran uh, and to separate themselves from the United States and one of the key challenges for us is not to be separated from the Europeans. That's one of the reasons I want the tone of what we do and a senior envoy to be part of this, because I think under those circumstances, there is some leverage for us. We can address, I think, some of the concerns that are legitimate about the deal. Great. We're going to our next question. All right. I think they're closing. Uh, yeah, they're closing the door now, so I'm going to have to hang up, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Thank you right. so much. Thank you so much, right. Ambassador Dennis Ross, for speaking with us. Um, and and uh, right. bye bye. <laughs> bye. And to everyone else on the call, uh, thank you all for joining with us. Uh, please join us again for future calls and programs featuring a variety of experts, policymakers, and thought leaders on issues of significance to the U.S., Israel, and the global community. We are going to upload the recording of this call to our website, www.jcouncil.org and distribute the link in the JCRC's weekly email uh, that goes out tomorrow. We encourage you to share it with your friends and colleagues. Thank you all again for being with us on this important call.